Welcome to Share, a podcast production of Amethyst Recovery Centers. I'm your host, Kabir Singh. At the top of each episode, we like to remind our listeners that addiction is treatable and recovery is possible. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. When you're in active addiction, your identity tends to get tied up with substances. It's hard to learn about yourself when you spend so much of your energy on drinking or using drugs. Our guest today, Tawny Lara, is a writer, public speaker, a podcaster who writes, among many other things, about how sobriety has helped her learn about her sexuality. In her work, she aims to break stigmas about both recovery and sexuality. We're talking with Tony over Zoom today. Thanks for joining us. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Interesting topic we have today. I'm, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for this one. Not, no, no offense to you know previous podcasts that I have here. This, you know, interesting topic to talk about. Just f- forget about even you know recovery and and sobriety and things like that. Just I grew up in, a, in an age and time where we just didn't talk about this stuff. So it's, it's, a, it's a great thing about the world today um, that there's folks like you out there that are now doing one, talking about the subject itself and two, you know, in tandem with, with, with recovery. Um, I think it's an one. important intersection and it's not, like you said, it's not talked about enough. And I like to say that my target audience is me <laughs> from like early twenties, late teens, me because I didn't know what the hell I was doing or what was going on. So I, I, I kind of think through that lens when I write and talk about this subject. So, you, so you've written about how sobriety has helped you embrace your bisexuality. Can, can you tell us more about how? Yeah, definitely. So I've, I've always been very open about my sexuality of, you know, I've been with people regardless of their gender. Um, but there was this part of me that never felt like I could identify as bisexual um, because most, all of my long-term relationships have been with men. And I was, so it's just like one of those, a lot of internalized biphobia that I was able to unpack once I got sober. Um, You know, once you, once you remove alcohol from, from, from your life, you're able to really see things as they are. You have more energy to put into things that you didn't, really care to put energy into before. Um, and so that's what it was for me for like politics and sexuality and, uh, self-discovery. And it's, you know, it's ever evolving. It's interesting how you brought that up Did, with, with your particular lived experience and identifying as bisexual, were, were you aware of that in, in, in active alcoholism, active addiction, whatever we want to choose to call it here. Um, did, you, did you identify with, did the identification take place after in recovery? Um, identifying what, as bisexual? Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, I, I quote, came out as bisexual um, about like three years sober, but everyone who knows me knows that I've been with people regardless of their gender. I just never really called it anything and felt like I wasn't, I I was like, Oh, you're not bisexual enough. You like, you can't really claim pride in that. (laughs) So, um, so like that's some of the internalized biphobia that I was talking about. And cause you know, there wasn't a lot of bisexual representation in film and media until very recently. And that, representation so important to just see people like you up on screen that it's huge yeah it's, it's it's so interesting when people seek to typecast us it's like you're not <laughs> bisexual enough i remember being in, in this treatment center which was basically like the skid row of the county that i was in with with the non-insured people back in 2009 and, 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 I, and I like i had a car still i happened to like be able to have hung on and the, the, this guy's like you're a high bottom addict like a, he's like uh i'm in here with you pal um so <laughs> it's it's always interesting so I'm, I'm glad you were you know as you use the language and, and i love that language as, as a peer specialist you know to unpack things in this process to understand more about ourselves and to be able to come forward with that and and, and present it to um the world in, in authenticity which I, I can certainly feel that's coming through um from you 
I know for a, a, a large in part that using and sex are go hand in hand, especially in active addiction. And a lot, a lot of times after um, getting clean, getting sober, you know, sexual experiences are, are different. Per, perhaps people feel like they, they can't perform at, like they used to, or the liquid courage that I used to take when I'd approach, you know, a female in a in whatever setting. Um, how, how was that for you? That, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I think that is, that is such an important topic when you talk about, um, you know, confidence in the bedroom being tied to alcohol use. You talk about being experimental in the bedroom. People think, oh, I need to take a shot first. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all of this, like, you know, we know that alcohol, quote, lowers our inhibitions, right? And it gives us that shot of liquid courage that we think we need. But like, I think like, for me, sobriety is really just like, you have to be really confident to get sober. Like it requires this huge amount of confidence and belief in yourself for you to say, I'm not going to get wasted anymore. Like I'm going to examine my relationship with alcohol and I don't care what anyone has to say about it. Like that is a huge confident step. And so I think after that, after you take that big stand for yourself, these other things start to fall into place. And, you know, so that's helped me re-examine like uh, the sex I was having when I was active in my substance abuse, there was a somewhat performative element to it where it was what I think my partner or who I was with at the time, what I think they want me to do. Um, I didn't ask for what I wanted. I felt like I was there to please them. And it was just this, it was not, not an equal, it wasn't equal. And it's because I didn't, I didn't make it a priority to request (laughs) it to be equal. Like, you know, I was with good, I had good partners. Like they, if I would have spoken up, they would have reciprocated. Um, but I didn't really respect myself enough to, to think, Hey, like, I want to try this, or I actually don't want to do that, you know? Um, and so in sobriety, it's like, I'm with people that I, uh, I, I have a partner now. Um, but like, I feel much more confident in like speaking up and asking for what I want and stating what I don't want. There's, there is certainly an undoubtedly a haze that, that is put on life as a whole, when, especially in, in active uh, use, uh, what, whatever it is. I, I, I know um, a, 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 in the male demographic that, that I've worked with, especially as a, a peer specialist, there was a, there was a strong linkage between um, performance on, on opiates. There was a, a much, much longer ability like to, uh, to last longer really is what it was. And then how that's highly diminished when, when they got clean, when they got sober and, mm. and what would happen, you know, after that. So I, I've seen that as well. And, and it's important. And, and I, I really, really appreciate how you bring up the fact about the, the intimacy here, the, the piece that is missing. But now that you're in recovery, or right when you got into recovery, was there a period of time that you abstained from relationships? But as you yeah, definitely. I didn't follow the the one year mark rule. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like most people usually don't, but um, my I, I met someone at like three or four months, and we we hit it off really well. And I was just like, it felt right to explore it, and so I did. And it was it was fine. You know, it, we didn't stay together, but I don't regret exploring that. And um, but I actually after that. I would go like go on a date here or there, but I was very, very single for a good, like two years. It was, and I think that was one of the best gifts I could have given myself because I really got to know myself on such a deep level, you know, of sobriety, of course, but also when you're not dating and when you're, when you're dating yourself, (laughs) if you want to look at it like that, you know, you're, when you're dating yourself and figuring out what you like sexually, figuring out um, what you're looking for in a significant other, um, what you will and won't settle, settle for. 
And I know like my list of standards as a, as a drunk party girl was very different than my list of standards now. Like the things that I, I just won't, I won't put up with a lot of things that I used to put up with. Can you tell us more? Uh, I'm, <laughs> my curiosity, I'm, I'm definitely interested. Well, like my state, my list of standards was like, okay, they have to like have tattoos and love rock and roll <laughs> and be able to like chug whiskey with me. Like that was my checklist. (laughs) So I met people like that and I had fun, but it really wasn't healthy. (laughs) And uh, now my, my checklist is like, you know, I need someone who's not, not necessarily sober. My partner is sober, but like someone who prioritizes mental health, like that is important to me. Like someone who goes to therapy, someone who talks about their feelings, someone who is in touch with who they are and like the shit they've been through. That is really important to me as a, as a person. Um, and that's also what I look for, like in friends too, you know, like I still have friends that, that drink, but like, I don't have anyone in my close circle that like gets wasted on a regular basis. Like I just can't, um, I can't, I can't be around that. It's not good for me. Like no judgment to anyone who lives that lifestyle. I, it is not good for my health to be around someone that is blacking out regularly. It's definitely, I agree with that. It's definitely incongruent with being in recovery. It's it's sort of nonsensical, if you will. Why why would I could be, or be hanging out with anyone you know, snorting Coke and drinking and things like that that going on that it it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel right, especially after some time in recovery. And then in the beginning, it was, it was a bit bit sorted for me. I was, it was very hard to let go of those uh, relationships before even forget about intimate relationships, just like the friendships that you spoke about. Um, What what was the hardest adjustment for you when, when sort of transitioning into recovery, getting sober, what was the hardest part about in the relational aspect was it meeting people again what what was that I yeah I've always struggled with dating just like my whole adult life it's always been hard for me um I've never been a fan of online dating like I would try the apps and I would I'd get on it and I'd like create a profile and I'd then I would just like I'd hate it (laughs) it's like like a second job I mean, the, it I, is. I messed with it for a while. It was so much work. I mean, I was like, even, you know, figuring out what's real. Yeah. What's not like, I agree. I always had the, the best luck meeting people in person. I mean, even if they weren't right for me, the connection was somewhat pretty genuine. Even if it was over something pretty shallow, it was still like we met because we were in the same place at the same time. And I liked that. And that's how I I actually met my partner in an AA meeting. Um, But I feel like I'm sidetracking and I totally forgot. Oh, the biggest transition Um, and talking about dating. Yeah. Really talking, figuring out when to talk about dating or when to talk about sobriety on a, like either on a date or in the app or um, I tried putting it on my profile just to like filter out people that would have an issue with it. And then I tried, then, then I got people messaging me like with their whole life stories, like, Oh, you like telling me their relationship with alcohol. And I'm just like, I'm not your therapist. This is, I'm, I'm not ready. For, I don't want to do this. So then I took it off my profile and then like, I would go on a couple dates with someone and then I would tell them that I was sober. And then it would just, I would feel like, like if it, if sobriety is a deal breaker for someone, I need to know that like upfront before I go on a couple dates with them. So like, and it's so personal to like, like if you're listening and you don't know (laughs) when you should put sober on your, on your dating app, or if you should, it's so, so personal. Yeah, it is. It is very personal. So have you have in this experience that you just spoke about, have you found people to date that are not technically sober, but I, we call them normies or whatever you want. Yeah. Call it. And it works. Is it? Yeah, I definitely, you know, I met someone, um, 
because I like I've met people because like I said, we were at the same place at the same time, like meeting someone at a concert, meeting someone at a seminar. Um, you know, like we have this thing in common that's that we're already like we really like this band or we're we're really excited about this seminar subject. Um, so that's like that's a that's meaningful to me, and that builds somewhat of a meaningful connection. Um, and like I said, I met my partner in an AA meeting. AA is not a big part of my story. I've been to like a handful of meetings, but I guess I got, <laughs> I got what I needed out of it. Cause I, I found my beloved. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. The, you, you've certainly talked about, you know, sobriety has, has made you more excited to, to learn in a curiosity over overarching curiosity about the world. Do you think that, that these things are connected to your learning about sexuality uh, and, and if so, how, you know, kind of how is that? Yeah, my my podcast co-host, Lisa Smith, she always tells me that I'm intellectually curious. And she, and I, I like that term because I, once I got sober, I just had this insatiable appetite for knowledge, education, um, really this sense of trying to make up for lost time because I partied for you know, like 12 years and I didn't really pay attention in school. And, um, now I'm kind of making up for lost time and sex and sexuality has been a huge part of that, of that journey of, like I said, learning more about what bisexuality means, seeking representation, um, you know, and then just like self-discovery, like reading books about sex and sexuality and the female body. And, and that's been huge. You're, so real quick, drop us your podcast here in case the listeners want to find you. I, I'm not oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Where, yeah. Um, our podcast is called uh, Recovery Rocks, where we talk about recovery and rock and roll. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, the public speaking hasn't been, probably hasn't been a whole bunch of that, right? During this pandemic. Honestly, I love public speaking <laughs> in a pandemic because it's right here in my little cherry blossom cove in my apartment. <laughs> um, so if you're you're listening and you don't see, but Kabir can see me. I I live in you know a small Manhattan apartment. So I got a couple room dividers and I created an office for myself. Um, so I'm surrounded by cherry blossoms <laughs> when it, I'm when I'm it's working. It's I love it. I really I really appreciate it. Um, so public speaking in a pandemic is, is this, which I love because it's like, I'm getting paid the same amount and I don't have to commute or go anywhere. Or <laughs> I just like, I like, all right, I'm going to go, go do this thing for an hour. Or there, and there, there's higher, in, in a lot of instances, there's, there's higher engagement. Either you, yeah. Paying, right. The, the, the barrier to sort of, oh, I don't want to go like and listen to whoever. Oh, exactly. So. And I think there's people that are not, I think like, I know there's people that are attending events that they wouldn't before, like a, an event about sobriety. Like I do a lot of sober sex and dating panels. Someone may not feel comfortable going to a live event like that, where they don't know anybody and maybe they're not open about their sobriety or, you know, there's a lot of reasons to not go to a live event like that. Um, but there's, you can attend one of these events with your camera off. And then, you know, these people will like message me on Instagram after and say, thank you so much. Like I was, you know, I live in Indiana and I can never go to your talks in New York, but now I can. So like, it's pretty cool. It is cool. And how, how do we find you on Instagram? At Tawny M. Lara. Um, I guess you'll probably have my name spelled in the. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to have in it. the notes. Yeah. Exactly. Tawny M. Lara, M for Michelle. <laughs> Tony and Michelle Lara, that's wonderful. So people actually, yeah. so that's, that's interesting because where the, the pandemic ha, has suppressed a lot of people's work in a lot of ways. I, I did a podcast previously about about the um, the, the restaurant industry and and, and servers and, and and the like hospitality and that's, that go, I mean that goes without saying. Nobody needs to be a genius here. That that's there's been quite a um, issue with that, with that and, and everything stemming from that. Um, so th that's, that's, that's really cool to hear. Cause, and that makes a lot of sense, right? Cause where, where I may not want to sit elbow to elbow with somebody and, and just kind of uncomfortable sexuality and recovery, like 
getting sober and alone in the beginning, especially, uh, is tough enough in, in end of itself. So th- th- that's, that's awesome to hear. Um, how do you think that recovery overall can help people learn about themselves? I see your enthusiasm. I see you here on the screen. It's a podcast. Of course, the listeners are not going to be able to see this, this wonderful smile that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, how do you think recovery can help people learn about themselves? Maybe wider than just sexuality. Yeah, really good question. I think even just taking some time to examine your relationship with, you know, fill in the blank, whether it's alcohol, drugs, sex, video games, um, whatever it is, I think it's taking a step back and really examining, you know, when am I reaching for these things when when am and what am i feeling when i'm reaching for this like it, you know are you triggered by something or are you um are you reminded of something are you um anxious are you bored are you lonely um you know and these are all valid and important emotions and it's imp- and it's important to to get connected to that and i think so like to answer your question recovery like Get, just getting to know yourself and why you reach out to for external gratification is super helpful. And you don't even have to be quote sober to do that. Like, that's why I'm a big fan of the sober curious movement because there's people that are saying, you know, Hey, I, you know, I don't want to stop drinking forever, but you know, I do want to take some time off. I do want to get to know a little bit more. And that really taps into this, Un- untapped demographic of people that d- don't necessarily want to go to an AA meeting, but they want to learn, they want to learn, you know? And so now that like we're in this conversation, I think more there's people that are coming to these sober sex and dating panels that don't, that still drink alcohol, but they're like, I just, I, I don't want to need alcohol to get kinky with my partner you know, like, so it's, it's really interesting to see how these intersections keep crossing. That is the, the, um, the sober curiosity movement is, is, is definitely an interesting one. And there's, you know, for me, I did get clean, did get sober through, through 12 step, but sort of moving past that certified as, as a peer recovery specialist, you know, multiple pathways to recovery, right? Harm reduction, Things like that. And there, there, there isn't a linear path to this. Um, and I, re- I so appreciate you shedding light on that because it's important for the listeners to know that you know maybe like 100% sober is not not your thing. But I, I think it's part part of the human experience is is these interpersonal relationships, right? Even even the most normal people, and I don't really even know what the heck that means, but. Uh, um, you know, struggle with communication and, and interpersonal relationships. So this this process of self discovery that that you've unpacked so well on this podcast um, really sheds a, a lot of light on on the different sort of again you mentioned intersections of this. I think that's a real really cool way to describe it. Um, stigma is a huge thing. It's stigma with identifying sexuality. We have we, <clears throat> a lot of different movements these days as it pertains to. Um, I, sexual identity, um, people who are transitioning, um, people who are getting sober, getting clean, you know, addicts, alcoholics, all these words, right? They're all swirling around out there. What's the, what is the importance of breaking stigma when it, when it comes to, when we encapsulate, when it comes to both sexuality and addiction, the, the, the stigma's there? Yeah, um, I, I think it's important to, a big stigma is that, you know, women don't like sex. Women, women aren't supposed to like sex. We're supposed to be very sexy and visually appealing, but we're supposed to be these like demure beings that are like subservient and that's just not realistic. Um, so I think for women or people assigned female as birth that are non-binary trans, a huge part of that is really getting in touch with, with your sexuality and, distinguishing your sexuality from what society tells you your sexuality should be. And I think that is an everlasting journey, just like recovery, you know, like we're still learning what 
we're still learning new things about who we are as sober people. I'm still learning things about who I am just as a, as a person, as a sexual being. And, and that's just ongoing. And I think you, you, like I mentioned earlier about how sobriety requires a great deal of confidence, you apply that same confidence to getting to know yourself sexually. Like it's, it really is super important. So appreciate everything you shared with us today. The, the, the overarching theme that, that I'm taking with myself is for myself rather is that the, the process of self-discovery here. So that there you have it, folks. We hope that Tawny showed you that recovery gives you the courage to be honest and vulnerable, provides an opportunity to live your most authentic life and, and can lead to real joy. We appreciate you joining us today, Tawny. Thank you for having me. Of course. If you or your loved one needs help with addiction, call Amethyst today at 855-80-SOBER or visit us online at amethystrecoverycenters.com. To find more episodes of SHARE, visit amethystrecoverycenters.com backslash SHARE or subscribe wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. I'm Kabir Singh, and we'll see you next time.